All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Charlene Ortiz, and today we are going to continue discussing the scientific method. And previously, we did cover some basic fundamentals of the scientific method. One of the first things that we discussed was, was what is the definition of science? We also talked about the definition of what the scientific method is. We divided the scientific method into, into separate steps. So we talked about the steps of the scientific method in our previous lecture. We talked about how to identify a problem. We talked about how to develop a research plan. We also talked about our third step, which would be to actually conduct your study. And we also elaborated on step four, which is analyze and evaluate the data that you may encounter once you conduct a study. And our last step that we managed to discuss in our previous lecture was step five, which is we want to communicate our results. Before we get started with the rest of the lecture, are there any questions about those topics that we covered last week? No? Fantastic. Outstanding. So today we are going to cover the last step in the scientific method. And that last, last step, we are talking about the generation. We're going to generate new ideas, right? So why do we need to generate new ideas? Well, generally when we conduct a research, right, we want to ensure that the information we are gathering actually serves a purpose, right? How many times have you guys been exposed to research and you're thinking, who cares? What is the, how is this of have any use, right, for the general public or for the greater good of science or for the development of humankind, right? And we often encounter that problem. That is why we need to generate new ideas. We want to make sure, especially in the field of psychology, that we're either contributing to theory or that we're contributing to or towards practice, I should say. One of the first things that we can do when we generate new ideas is we can move forward from research findings. What does that mean? It means that we're going to build upon previous research, right? So we conduct research to build upon previous research, right? So let me give you an example. Let's suppose that you are conducting and you come across when you do your psych info research, right? And you come across this article that you really like, I right? think the article is interesting when we're doing lab and the article, let's say it talks about, say, Hispanic Americans in graduate school, right? That sounds interesting. But you're thinking, I wonder if I can expand upon this. And this is where we want to expand upon existing research. So say, for example, this study is about, let's consider graduate students in the engineering program that are experiencing increased panic attacks at your age, right? But you're thinking, well, what about, let's talk about Black African Americans, right? What about transgender people, right? Do we know anything about that, about our transgender students that are in the graduate program of engineering and say, are they experiencing more symptoms or panic attacks at the school, right? So remember that one of the points of generating new ideas is to build upon whatever we have already found. Now, sometimes when we have to generate more ideas, it just so happens that maybe you didn't find anything that was, for example, statistically significant, right? You conducted your study, right? You conducted your study with transgender students in the university, it just so happens that statistically there was no difference between, say, cisgender persons and persons who identify as trans or non-binary. Does that mean that your research is faulty? Not necessarily. But we will have to evaluate whether or not you actually had or didn't have any support for your research. Let's suppose that everything was conducted adequately, you had good supervision, you conducted the correct statistics, you gathered the correct data from our population, you will either have to reformulate your hypotheses, because maybe your hypothesis was faulty. Say you made a prediction, if you remember from our previous lecture, hypothesis is a prediction, right? So you said, 
persons in the graduate program of engineering that identify as transgender will experience more panic attacks when compared to cisgender graduate students in the engineering program. That's how a good hypothesis we're making um, a prediction. Of course, you have to define what's a panic attack, what's transgender, right? What's a graduate student? So either you would have to reformulate your hypotheses, or maybe you just need to start over. Maybe your research was faulty and you need to conduct it again. So that's a good factor of whenever we find no support for your research, Generally, it's because we either have to reformulate our hypotheses, there might have been some statistical error. So keep that in mind. That should be our last step of conducting a research in regards to the site method. Are there any questions about perhaps any of the other steps or this new step? Any questions? Fantastic. Outstanding. Hashtag fantastic. I should start adding that. Should I not? Now, you may be thinking, I've never conducted an experiment before, but I know things, right? I know for a fact that the sky is blue, right? I know that when people feel sad, more than likely they'll start crying. But that is because we have other methods of knowing. We have other means to understand and gather information. So let's talk about, let's talk about what other means do we have to understand that information. Well, first of all, one of the ways that you can gather new information and know about something is through tenacity. And in regards to tenacity, it's basically a belief that's always been accepted. Right? So let's go back to when you were in your hometown, whether it be a small town, big town, and I'm sure there's a belief in your town, right, that was always held. And that's how you came to understand that topic. It's like, oh, this is what they think, right? It simply is there and we accept it. We accept it as a source of knowledge. Generally, this involves some sort of uh, folklore. It usually implies a form of tradition, if you will. Oh, that's the way it's always been in my town. So that's probably how it's supposed to be. The problem with tenacity is that that knowledge can be inaccurate, right? For example, for many years, we understood that, you know, if there was thunder and lightning somewhere, that probably meant that a deity, right, was angry at us, right? And that's how they understood the world. But notice that even though it was a shared belief and it was simply accepted, notice that in that regard, it could be inaccurate. Right? because we don't have other forms of foundation or evidence to show and demonstrate that that thought and that knowledge that came from tenacity, if it's actually accurate. Are there any questions about tenacity as a method of knowing? All right, good deal. Now we also have another way through which we can gather information that we know about something. And that's intuition, right? Intuition, it's simply that hunch, right? It's simply the hunch, it's a subjective method or feeling that something is correct, right? It's simply a hunch, it's a subjective view about this is probably right. So think about your best friend, your bestie, your BFF, whatever you would like to call it. So think about your best friend. And when your best friend was dating a specific person, right? You, when you met this person, you're like, I don't know if I like this guy, or I don't know if I like this lady. Now, the problem with that type of belief is that firstly, it's subjective. 
And when something is subjective, it's because it generally hasn't been defined. And how do I know that my hunch is more accurate than your hunch, right? Because it hasn't been operationally defined. There's other factors, of course, but let's consider that. So let's go back to the example about your best friend. They met someone and you're thinking, I have a feeling that this is not going to be good for this person. Or vice versa. Your best friend met someone and you're like, wow, this guy is great. Love this guy. Or love this lady. This lady's fantastic for my friend. There's a downfall, however, to intuition. When it comes to intuition, we don't have a definitive basis as to why we think something is good or bad. There's no definitive basis other than your own subjective feeling that this is a certain way. So for all we know, you can be entirely incorrect. Let's think about uh, Ted Bundy, right? Everybody thought he was a charming guy, and that was their intuition, right? For those of you who are familiar with that case, right? A lot of people were immensely persuaded by him. They thought he was a good catch, so their intuition said, this guy's super cool. But notice that we don't have any foundation to think he was cool, right? So that's one of the downfalls of intuition. Now, I don't want you to think that because it has this disadvantage, that it has no place in science. I don't want you to think that. Because that's not accurate, right? We can use intuition to say, for example, develop a new research hypothesis. So it's not entirely all that bad, is it? Because if I think intuitively, if I show up to class, right, if you see me, you know, dress in business casual, all right? So if you see me dress in business casual, your intuition is going to tell you, Dr. Shar knows the thing or two about it. But what proof do you have of that? You really don't. Right? But you can develop a research hypothesis. You can say people consider people more knowledgeable when they wear business casual versus compared to wearing pajamas. So notice that you use a form of intuition, right? Because generally that is true. The better dressed someone is, the more likely we're going to think that they're an authority, and the more likely are you to help them, by the way. Right, so if I'm laying down on the floor with my pajamas, it's less likely that you will help me if we're in business or business casual. Right. So notice that it's not useless, right? We can actually use intuition in order to inform a hypothesis. Now, that's only true if we are able to test it through the scientific method. So we don't want to leave intuition just for intuition. We actually want to test it. We actually want to make sure that it had some value. Any questions about that? Good so far. Fantastic. Now, another thing that we need to consider is authority, right? Authority as a source of knowledge, right? It's something that we may know. The thing about authority is we simply accept that belief simply because it was stated by an expert or it was stated by something that's respected, right? So we simply take it at face value. We assume that it is true because it came from a source that we deem as respectable. We deem that this person is an expert. So we take it at face value. So something really interesting about authority is that, for example, many of us, including myself, I'm not familiar with the uh, theory of relativity, right? That would take many years, right? In the field of physics, right? So the scientists that do actually deal with the theory of relativity, I have to trust their authority that they know what they're talking about, right? Because I simply cannot do that, right? So I take it by basic authority that they know what they're doing, that this knowledge is accurate. And a good example of that can be, say, for example, the FDA, right? We don't work at the FDA. Many of us don't have the knowledge that it would take to work at the FDA, but we trust the regulations that they put forth, right? Because they hold that authority. We believe because 
they conduct experiments and they gather data, we think that because they have that authority, more than likely what they're saying is actually accurate. It's actually depicting knowledge. Now, another thing, another form of authority, I want you to think about, say, a journal, right? There's reputable journals, right? There's journals that are better than others. But what makes them better than others intrinsically, right? It's their authority. We think that because they have a very difficult method of us applying our research and submitting that paper to that journal, we think, okay, well, they must know what they're talking about. It's really difficult to get an article published there. But notice that that's because of authority. The problem, main problem with relying on authority as a source of knowledge is that we are accepting something solely based on face value without question. Like we're simply accepting this. So imagine me right now, me teaching. This is a form of knowing because of authority. You think that because, you know, I went to school for however many years, right? You think, well, Dr. Sharp should know something about something, right? And she's dressed in this fashion, right? So we're thinking, I have to trust that Dr. Shar knows what she's talking about because she was hired, she went through an interview process. So because of that, you take it at face value that I know what I'm talking about. But ultimately, what evidence do you have that I know what I'm talking about? Well, you know, I'm just pulling it, you know, out of a hat, like a rabbit, right? Now, I don't want you to think that there's no value for authority in science just because something is taken without question. Because ultimately, Many scientists will opt to publish in a journal that is that has some authority because of the process, right? Because the process that they have that's going to be difficult, those papers get rejected the first time and the second time and the third time. So it does take a long time. So it may not necessarily be faulty because we are trying to understand science and we want to make sure that that research was conducted in a rigorous manner. So perhaps authority is not necessarily a bad idea when it comes to that type of value in science. Any questions about that? I like to think about parents too. Parents are a method of knowing through authority. What controversial. Because when we're children, you know, we take what our parents say at face value. Right. If my parents were to tell me when I was you know, a little girl, they told me the sky is purple. I have no reason to doubt my parents until I actually start growing up and I start getting evidence from other sources of knowing, from other methods of knowing. And then I understand, hmm, there's evidence to the contrary. The sky is purple. Right. So learning from parents sometimes can also be seen as a method of knowing through authority. Now, we're also going to talk about rationalism. Rationalism as a method of knowing. And I don't necessarily enjoy this example because, and, but however, you will see it on the kind of practice, I'll tell you that. Well, my husband or my spouse or my girlfriend or whomever cheated on me because simply, that person simply doesn't love me. Right? You see that a lot in practice. How do we come to this conclusion? Well, it's because of rationalism, right? Now, per definition, it sounds pretty good, right? So strictly speaking, straight up from the book, is any source of knowledge that requires the use of reasoning and logic. That sounds pretty solid, right? I'm using reasoning, I'm using logic in order to come to a conclusion, right? That sounds pretty sound. So why is it that it could be faulty? Well, let's imagine something in a logical example that all of you guys are familiar with, right? A logical example is it quacks like a duck, quacks like, uh, walks like a duck, right? Must be a duck. That would be a logical conclusion. But what are you basing that on? Well, I, logically, it quacks like a duck, walks like a duck, okay? Well, you know, it could be a plush toy. It could be somebody dressed as a duck. It could be a toy. So even though logic sounds sound, sounds like a good method to gather and know information, notice that it is also faulty. Because when you are conducting logical reasoning, 
You're only looking at that one specific piece of information. Right? You're drawing a conclusion for a very specific source of information, which is why quacks like a duck, walks like a duck, it doesn't necessarily mean it's a duck. Because that was a conclusion based on reasoning and logic. Although it sounds sound, it doesn't necessarily mean it's true. Right? Just because something is logical, it makes sense to you, that doesn't make it true whatsoever. Because of that, we tend to draw more erroneous conclusions. Even the most rational ideas could be wrong. Right? Even something that makes extreme sense to you. Right? Say, for example, aggression. Right. So some people would say, you know, you need to defend yourself. That aggression is valid. Okay, logically speaking, that would make sense. But what if the aggressor uh, has a weapon, right? You might want to flee that situation because now you're at a disadvantage. You don't have any. So notice that even something that sounds logically sound, even if that sounds correct, that doesn't make it true. Now, there, are, there is some value to be rational and using reasoning and logic. That's because you can develop research hypotheses, but you will have to subject them. You have to test this rational idea through a hypothesis. So in keeping with our little example of the quacks like a dog or monks like a dog, you would gather that data plus that sum, right? And then, yep, it turns out it doesn't have any organs. It's a robot, right? So you can actually test your logical idea towards a scientific standard. Any questions about that? All right. Good deal. Good deal. Our next topic as to how do we learn, how do we find knowledge is that of empiricism. This is traditionally defined as, as knowledge that we acquire through observation. If I see it, if I touch it, if I smell it, if I feel it, it must be true, right? It's basically what we can acquire through our senses, right? Generally, we think about observation, right? We generally think about, well, I can clearly look out the window, right? I can clearly look outside and say, the sky's not purple. I can literally see it, right? The idea is basically seeing is believing. You didn't go through that experience, I did. So I know it happened because I felt it, right? Or I saw it. Okay. I like to think about like ghosts and stuff like that. Right? So you weren't there and I saw it, I promise you, right? Something that we need to remember is that empiricism could be biased. That's a big disadvantage. And you're thinking, I know I saw it, I felt it, I smelt it, I tasted it, I know it was there, it happened. But the problem with that, what sets it apart from the scientific method is that not everyone experiences the same things the same way. And I can take a quick survey right now. Some of you may think, oh, I like went to class with Dr. Shaw, right? I like it. The person next to you may be like, I hate it. I think it's so awful. And you're all having the same method of instruction, the same classroom, with the same temperature, same microphone. Your experience is literally not different than that from the next person. But notice that your perception of that event could be biased. Maybe the person right next to you didn't eat. They're a little angry. They're angry or maybe they didn't sleep, or they just legitimately don't like this teaching style, right? So that's the problem with empiricism, is that from our experiences, we like to think that our eyes record everything as we see it. So you can say objectively, I absolutely hate Dr. Char's class. Or you can say, I absolutely love it. But the problem is we're not recording and getting this information as we think we're getting it, because it is biased. It's based on so many factors. They're likely out of your control and my control, but it's still going to inform you, right? You're still going to know whether or not you like this class. 
Any questions so far? All right. I like to think about witness testimony where I hear the, these things. I mean, prosecutors and, and defense attorneys really rely on if there's this, oh, you saw the guy, I saw the car, I saw him running, he took off northbound so-and-so, right? And we need to understand that as a little side note, witness testimony is the lowest method or the lowest level of evidence, right? It's a little side note. It's considered the lowest form of evidence, particularly because it relies a lot on empiricism, right? It relies on observation. So we could be biased. Interestingly, empiricism is not all that bad. Because in order to fix that, we can operationally define that source that you saw. So in this case, let's talk about the class. Is the class good? Did you like the class? So what is like? If I define a good class in a bad class and I gave you a survey, good is defined as X, Y, Z. And if I were to distribute that survey here, that would be a better method because I am operationally defining the term and I know what it's going to look like, right? So perhaps good, you're going to do a rating, right? Whether it be in my delivery, the slides, the energy, uh, the topics, breadth of the knowledge, right? So I can define that a million ways. So you can say whether or not operationally, we can say, okay, I did like Dr. Shar's class or I did not. Any questions? Fantastic. All right. One of the next things that I would like to talk about is the goals of science. And we're going to go through this a little bit quickly. So the goals of science are always going to include four different aspects, right? First one will be to describe. The second one will be to explain. Third one would be to predict. And the last one would be to control. Because notice that with, other, with the other methods of knowing, we gather information. But in our previous examples, for example, through tenacity, through authority, through empiricism, and the rest of them, that wasn't the goal. Their goal was to describe, explain, predict, and control. Whereas they might have had one of those goals instead of all of them. So that's why the scientific method tends to be a little bit more sound. Generally here in social sciences, we are focused in understanding the behaviors that we can't see. I can't see someone experiencing schizophrenia. I can see someone crying. I can see someone failing my class. So notice that if I were to do an experiment or a survey or things of that nature, I would still need the scientific method in order to accurately observe the behavior. For example, you're failing my class. Vice versa, if you're doing great, I want to know why you are doing great. So maybe I can exploit that and pass it on to the next student and the next student. Now, there are different ways that we can do so. We can do a basic research. Or none of us are basic, by the way. You're in my class, you're not basic. That's how I see it. But we're gonna talk about basic research. What is basic research? We want to understand, we want to understand fundamental questions. We want to answer fundamental questions, right? Generally, these involve theoretical issues. So for those of you and all of you who should have taken introductory classes before you, you started taking this course, you remember how many theories we have. We have um, psychoanalytic, cognitive, behavioral. So generally, that's what basic research is interested in, understanding the foundational aspects of theory. Because keep in mind, we wouldn't be able to practice if we didn't have that foundation, right? So a lot of people think, oh, research is it's not necessary. Research classes are not necessary. Statistical, uh, statistics classes, experimental classes. But notice that without that, you wouldn't be able to practice in the future. Right? Because where are we going to get that scientific information? So we're only going to get it through this method. Generally, they are 
interesting, interested, I should say, in the underlying mechanisms of what leads behavior, right? And like I mentioned, they're really not interested in that practical application, are they? Because generally, we're talking about more of that theoretical frame. We're talking about that theoretical frame. And usually, they will build, build upon existing theory, right? So they're going to look at a research as based through the psychoanalytical theoretical framework, right? So generally, that's what they're trying to explore. Any questions about that? Fantastic. Now let's move along. So it's another method of research, which is applied research. Contrary to our previous method of, of knowing, basic research is interested in the fundamental theoretical aspect of behavior. But here we're moving along another sense. Here we are actually worried in the applied, in the process of trying to solve practical problems, practical things that we would see every day, right? So for example, think about the example that I gave you earlier, graduate students in engineering suffering panic attacks at the, on campus. Right? That's a problem we've identified, right? For example, so we could conduct research to try to address that practical problem. The research implies that we are going to apply whatever it is that we find out, if it is accurately and sound, we're going to apply this to solve this problem. So the point of this is to basically roll up your sleeves and apply that knowledge with that populace. Some examples could be what I mentioned, behavioral disorders, panic attacks, drug addiction, right? We're actually trying to roll up the sleeves and trying to solve an actual real life problem. Notice that one is not more valuable than the other. I don't want you to think that basic research is less valuable or applied research is less valuable. They both need each other. One wouldn't necessarily work with the other. Any questions about that? Outstanding. Hashtag outstanding. I need to start putting all that stuff up, huh? All right. So let's move along other methods of acquiring knowledge. And most of you will be familiar already with quantitative research. So who can tell me what quantitative even sounds like? What can you tell me quantitative research is? Anybody, any thinkers? So we can tell me what quantitative research is. Would it be just like a bunch of like numbers? Yeah. Well, we're talking about quantitative research. We are generally referring to statistics. We're generally referring to a numeric value. So let's think about anxiety, right? Anxiety is a category, right? It's a category of mental illness. But say we can define anxiety and record the results of a statistically validated and standardized assessment tool. And I can actually get a numeric value, right? I can get a numeric value. And I can say, I'm going to compare graduate students, cis graduate students of engineering and their anxiety. And I'm going to compare it to, let's say, the transgender engineering grad graduate students in engineering, right? And I can actually compare those two results. Right. We're thinking about a number. We're thinking about a numeric value. This is immensely common in behavioral sciences. If you're thinking, I did not want to study psychology to deal with a bunch of numbers. If not, I would have studied math or engineering. We are out of luck because we do math. You can't run away from the kids. It's going to hunt. You will see it, right? You just can't run away from it. Because we do quantitative research in mental health and in behavioral sciences. The point of this quantitative research is because it allows you to objectively analyze observations, right? So I'll give you an example. Say I have 
a graduate student here who is transgender, and I have a cisgender graduate student. And I just show you these individuals and you say, I think the person in the left has more anxiety than the person in the right. Well, how accurate and objective is that measure? Probably not, right? That goes back to the black side of the right? It goes back to empiricism. I can see it ties all back together. Look at that with a little bow, full circle, right? So notice that it allows us, if I give these individuals, say for example, the anxiety inventory or another tool that is used to say, for example, address panic attacks, that would be a far more accurate measure than if I were to ask you guys, hey, let's rate this guy, let's rate this guy, right? Because that's not necessarily accurate. point about quantitative research is that it gives us a wide understanding of the population. So generally when we conduct quantitative research, we are observing a large amount of people, right? Generally it's more than 20, right? At least 20 people. Um, you will see that eventually when you start conducting statistics here in this class, particularly the laboratory. But for those of you who are watching, remember that generally, when we are talking about sample size, you know, at least for parametric statistics, usually want to have more than 20. The sample size, however, is determined by statistics itself, but that's something we would cover a little bit more in detail in lab. Now, who can tell me what qualitative research is, right? If quant quantitative sounds like quantity, right? What's the, what does qualitative sound like? Who can tell me? Yes, ma'am. I'm oh, sorry? Uh, it's not numeric, correct. It's qualitative to me sounds like qualities, right? And that's literally what we're looking into. The qualities, the characteristics, what makes this particular observable aspect, what makes it it, but without that numeric value. Interestingly, in this regard, when we are thinking about qualitative research, notice that we're not using numbers, right? So what are we using, right? What are we using? It's because generally when we are looking at qualitative research, I like to think about qualitative research as the predecessor for quantitative research. Why do I say that? Let's think about COVID, new phenomenon, Right? Don't know much about it. Working on it. But I have um, another course, and the vast majority of those individuals just got out of high school. And some of them are still in high school because of, that's their advanced class, right? Most of these young men and women have not been outside their home for a year in a classroom. That is a new phenomena. Now, should I conduct a statistical analysis or maybe a qualitative? In this particular case, without looking too much into it, but it sounds like I would first need to do a qualitative research. I need to know what it looks like before I can measure it. And that's what qualitative research is for. I want to know what it looks like. We conduct observations. I can do extensive interviews. Say, for example, I can pick one person through maybe six people, and that is a lot, believe it or not. Like I mentioned, a quantitative is usually 20 to however thousands of people you want it to be. But usually in qualitative research, we want a small number. Why is that, right? Because if you remember from our previous lecture, we talked about sample and population, right? So the larger the sample, generally the more sound that research or more representative is going to be to that large population. But qualitative research is different because I want an in-depth understanding of those categories or those qualities that you are experiencing. So this is unique, it's a brand new thing that's happening. So a lot of the students in my class are super excited to finally be in a classroom, but by the same token, they are freaking out, right? Interesting. But we will need to explore that in detail and a good way to do that is the qualitative research. I'm going to explore the qualities of that specific Phenomena. 
Any questions about that? Fantastic. Now, when we're thinking about science, oftentimes you're going to come across matters that almost look like science, right? That's when pseudoscience comes in. The thing about pseudoscience, however, pseudoscience, the actual term means unscientific or non-scientific. So I want you, every time you see pseudo on anything, that's basically what it means. It's non, whatever the term follows, right? So if it says pseudoscience, it means it's non-science, right? The problem with, with pseudoscience is that it does have a set of procedures that are not scientific. It simply does not have the same procedures as you normally would, but rather it's generally a set of beliefs. It's a set of beliefs. More often than not, they are accepted, right? more often than not, but it's simply to just show an impression of knowledge, to basically have that final say when it comes to knowledge. Sometimes they will come across as, as, I am the most reliable source out there, right? However, it is immensely difficult sometimes to draw that line, to draw that distinction between science and pseudoscience. The problem is that we generally assume that this information has to be accurate, if nothing else, because of authority, because Dr. So-and-so said so. And I'll give you an example. Sometimes you'll see in your book, you know, you'll buy a book somewhere, and it would say, Dr. You know, Dr. Peter Pan, PhD, right? And the book is about astrophysics, but he has a PhD in sociology. Right? But because of that presentation, we think, he must have conducted research in an accurate way, but perhaps it's pseudoscience. Maybe he starts saying something about you know, the sun is the size of a bottle cap, right? But because of authority, we, we will take it at face value. I don't want you to confuse pseudoscience with bad science. They're two separate things. Bad science could be simply a mistake, right? So the example that I was giving you earlier Say, if you have a fault in your research, you know, maybe the statistics were off. Maybe there was something else implied in that research that perhaps you overlooked or the definitions weren't accurate, your sample wasn't accurate. That would be bad science. Pseudoscience, on the other hand, does apply a level of deception. Um, it's kind of interesting to see that, that confrontation between when someone is being confronted with, hey, you know, this is... It's not good because they will say, no, this is good, spite of evidence of the contrary. You quite literally show them the sun is not the size of a bottle cap. They will hold on to that set of beliefs because it's not scientific. So any questions about that? Fantastic. 